for joining us this morning. Hope you enjoyed our tunes to get us started. Uh, I know that we can't travel to the Caribbean right now, so we thought we'd bring a little Caribbean to you this morning. Happy Friday. Uh, for those of you who have been following us during the Working Remotely series, series welcome back. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, this is a series that uh, QI Power Hour has been hosting over the last uh, number of weeks. Uh, to support uh, those going through transition um, who may be new to working remotely. Uh, so uh, feel free to check out our past sessions. Uh, we've had um, a few that are up and recorded on our session, so we welcome you to check those out. Uh, as we do with our QI Power Hour series, we like to begin by acknowledging the land that we're meeting on today. Uh, so today I'm joining you from my home office in Warman, which is situated on Treaty 6 territory in the traditional lands of the Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and as homeland of the Métis. Uh, we pay our respects to the treaties that were made on this land and acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. We are committed to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous nations in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And I know uh, many of my colleagues at HQC, we've been reflecting on uh, our gratitude and respect for the land, especially at this time. Um, I know that our living space has almost doubled now that we're able to get outside and, and enjoy nature. Uh, so we will be making a good use of the chat function today. Uh, Sherry has uh, some interactive components that she'll be flipping to you, uh, so we just want to let you know where to find the chat. Uh, so you can access the chat by clicking on the message bubble uh, in the bottom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this will launch, launch the chat panel to the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, so we welcome you to uh, send your questions, comments, and ideas uh, to everyone. And the way that you do that is to, let, to select all participants um, in the to field. So we'll just give folks a, an opportunity to practice that uh, by typing in the chat where you're joining us from today. Taylor, oh, so nice to see you, Taylor, joining us from Prince Albert this morning. Uh, Pam from Regina, some folks joining from Edmonton. Excellent. Looks like you found uh, the chat. Welcome, everyone. Um, Glenda Little, oh, so good. I see that you've relocated, but so glad to see you on QI Power Hour. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we do record our sessions and post them to the website following the event. So I know that folks are in different situations uh, nowadays than we might normally be finding ourselves in. So if you do get called away from the session, just know that it's being recorded and you can access the recording um, after the session today. Uh, so for those of you who are new to the QI Power Hour series, um, this has historically been a forum that brings together our community of learners uh, with an interest in quality improvement or QI. That's where the QI and QI Power Hour comes from. Uh, and as you may have noticed from our name, uh, the Health Quality Council, our, our topic area of, of um, discussion is quite often within the healthcare sector, uh, though we have seen uh, folks joining us from other sectors th throughout this uh, series, as well as um, in our broader QI Power Hour, uh, folks joining from uh, with an interest with, in improving the, the sectors and industries that they're each part of. Uh, so I've been reflecting over the past number of weeks of uh, how important um, uh, many different industries are to maintaining and promoting the overall health and well-being of each of our communities. Uh, so thank you uh, for joining us today. Thank you for learning to work in a new way um, in the interest of protecting your health and the health of others. So we thank you for um, dedicating an hour of your time today with us. Um, and we, we hope that you'll be able to continue joining us into the future. Uh, so another tool that we'll be using today is Twitter. So we invite you to use the handles QI Power Hour, HQC Fask, and Tactful Sherry today, uh, as, well, as well as the hashtag QI Power Hour. And with that, I'm delighted to welcome um, my friend and colleague, Sherry Furness, uh, who will be sharing with us uh, some insights today on moving from in-person learning to remote learning. So Sherry, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Chelsea. Awesome. Just 
doing its magic of making me presenter. Great. Um, so maybe I'll just share a little bit about me. So I, I have a background in education, uh, a master in distance learning with a focus on instructional design. Um, and so in, in my years working in this field, I've had some amazing opportunities to work with faculty, teachers, trainers um, in online courses, blended, in person. Um, I like to think I've learned just enough about agricultural medicine, popular music, <laughs> Renaissance history, uh, to be interesting at parties, if I were ever actually invited to parties or went to parties. That's my theory. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here today talking about something that I'm, I'm just so enthused about and it's wonderful to have, have so many people here on the call. Um, so the, when I was first thinking about this session, I asked Chelsea if we could do a special 20 hour edition, sort of like an all day, all night remote learning rager. Um, and uh, then I could literally tell you every thought I've ever had about the subject of remote learning. And Chelsea said, no, we are not doing that. Um, so for today, I've tried to scope it to some models and ideas that I hope can help you, thinking about how you can translate your learning into a remote environment from, from in person. Uh, but also knowing that this is a huge subject and we're really just diving into it a little bit today. Uh, at the end, I do have um, some resources that we'll share with you. Uh, and of course, these slides are also available to you as well, as Chelsea mentioned. So uh, the plan for today is a little bit of intro. What exactly is remote learning? What are we talking about? Um, I'll share some guiding principles around this process of translating and some examples of what it can look like to hopefully kind of get the creative juices flowing. Uh, please do keep using the chat for conversation, comments. Um, I know Riley and Chelsea are monitoring it, so they'll flag for me if there's, uh, if there's something to share. Um, think about your questions. We will have time at the end for a little bit of discussion. Uh, but first, I'd like to get a sense of your experience with remote learning. So using the chat, how would you describe how familiar you are with remote learning approaches? And you can use one of the uh, answers provided or feel free to make up your own. Some experience, not totally comfortable, curious, excellent. Yeah, a little bit. Zoom. Oh, new and excited, excellent. Good. Oh, lots of experience, wonderful. Not sure, I know, I believe everyone can do this. Yeah, new and excited. Oh, cool. Oh, excellent. Excellent. So some of you have, have been on the other side of it, receiving it. Uh, totally counts, I mean, it gives you a perspective of what what the experience is like for the learner, and that's always really, really helpful. Okay, so we have a nice mix. So, you know, for those of you that have uh, lots of experience, um, I'm, I'd encourage you in your chat, please continue to share your own experiences. Um, again, there's time at the end. We'd love to hear from you what's worked, what hasn't, uh, models or resources that you really would encourage people to use. Um, so this is, this is great. It's always nice to have a, a diverse mix because it does make it more interesting. Uh, so I thought it might be helpful to start with the definition of remote learning. Remote learning goes by uh, quite a few different names, and of course there are nuances between all of these things. Um, but my, my definition, just so that you know sort of um, how I'm thinking of it, um, so I think we often think that what remote learning is, is this. So it's someone on their own, at a computer, working through materials online. Uh, but really, remote learning just means that we're not all in the physical space together. And once we kind of let go of this idea that remote learning has to happen alone or you have to do it with computers, you know, I think that really opens the door to many different ways of learning outside of a shared physical space. And so it's maybe more helpful to think of it from the synchronous versus asynchronous perspective. So synchronous means at the same time, Asynchronous means not at the same time. So synchronous activities can include things like debates, workshops, group activities, panel discussions, um, you know, list goes on and on. For asynchronous, it might be things like watching videos, discussion forums, practice exercises. And of course, some of these activities could be synchronous or asynchronous. So you can have a live panel discussion or you could have a recorded one, for example. And all of these activities could, um, for the most part, be either in-person or remote. 
or as is becoming more and more common, a blend of both. So, for example, you might watch a video and then join a debate about it, or you might have a field trip that you go on, and then afterwards there's this individual activity on people's own time where they're writing a journal entry about it. So when we look at this, um, as you can see, only one of these options is online modules, what we might traditionally think of as remote learning. So in-person learning is more than being in a classroom, just as remote learning is more than being at a computer. And so I think maybe a more helpful way to think about the learning is, what do you want or need to do at the same time together? What are the things that you want or need to do at different times independently? The other thing I wanted to share in this intro is whether remote learning is effective, because uh, I think um, people have some thoughts or opinions or ideas about that. And I know um, for many, remote learning maybe is not necessarily a choice you would have made for how you want to deliver your training and your experiences. And it might even feel like a second best option or something that you're, you're having to do as a workaround or a make do. Um, but there has been a lot of research looking at how effective online learning is, remote learning. Uh, and it's been pretty consistent over the years in finding that remote learning and in-person are very comparable. Um, in fact, most studies find that there's no significant difference in learning between the two, two approaches. Um, and I think, you know, when I think about what makes learning effective or not, it is less about where it happens and that people are in the same space physically together. Uh, and it's more about all the other things. So the teaching itself, the learning culture that you might have, um, how you're connecting objectives to activities, uh, the feedback process, um, all of those things are really what makes a learning experience uh, good and effective. So this might not have been uh, your first choice, but I think just take heart that you can still provide some really amazing experiences for your learners using remote methods. Okay, so that is the intro part. Um, now let's get into some of the guiding principles. Um, and as I mentioned, Chelsea vetoed the idea of remote learning a palooza. Um, I thought adding palooza to it might make her more willing, but no, I was not given the 20 hours. Uh, so there are lots of different guiding principles out there, great ideas, ways of doing remote learning, um, theories that people have, have developed um, that are, are excellent. Uh, so this is not a full list, um, but for today, I thought I would share three guiding principles that I think are maybe most helpful for this process of translating your learning from in-person to remote. Uh, so start with objectives, follow the learning cycle, and tap into your creativity. Okay, so those of you who know me even slightly uh, will not be surprised to see learning objectives appear on this list of guiding principles. I love learning objectives, love them. Uh, so learning objectives are like the homing pigeons of instructional design. When you start with your objectives, you're always gonna be able to find your way. Um, and most likely your learning objectives haven't changed with the shift to remote learning. Uh, what you're trying to do is probably pretty much the same. You're trying to develop the same knowledge and skills as before. It's the how that's gonna be different. So your original plan might have been um, a classroom, sort of in-person workshop type of event, uh, but now you'll need to develop a new plan. But those objectives will remain consistent. So as a starting point, it's going back to those objectives and, and really thinking, what is this learning experience all about? What's gonna be different for participants by the end of it? So that's really the starting point, it's going back to those objectives. Um, so objectives are great, um, love them, uh, but they are the starting point. So now we come to the second principle, which is following that learning cycle. How are you going to achieve these objectives? What will your new plan be for getting there? For this kind of principle, I thought I'd like to introduce people to a model called Format. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's heard of it. Uh, please feel free to chat about it. Uh, so Format was developed by Dr. Bernice McCarthy, and it's based on research from some major learning theory rock stars, I would call them. Uh, so Lewin, Kolb, Vygotowski, Gagne, um, you know, a lot of the big names you see in learning theory, she, she basically, what I love about format is that it takes all this theory and then it synthesizes it into this really accessible model. So the model of format looks at these four aspects of learning. Uh, the why, the what, the how, and the what if. And it says that for learning to happen, we need to include all four of these quadrants in our learning plan, so this full cycle. 
So there is an assessment that you can take on, on the format website, and we will provide the link. It's in the resources that we'll share at the end. Um, and it can help you understand your preferred quadrant. And it is really fascinating when you look at uh, what, what you like, uh, quadrants you don't like. Um, we all have quadrants that we kind of hone in on that we're very comfortable with and ones that we're kind of like, yeah. And what sometimes happens when we're designing learning is that we spend a lot of time in our favorite quadrants and we kind of skip over some of the ones that, that we don't uh, like or we're less enthused about. So if I'm very strong quadrant two, I'm all about the what. Um, you might find that my lesson plan has a lot of content, but doesn't really give people a chance to practice or doesn't really provide through the context, the why for it. And so if my, if my participants are all quadrant two people as well, they're probably gonna quite enjoy the experience, but people that um, are strongly related to other quadrants are, are going to be uh, a little more challenged with the instruction. And ultimately, even if the quadrant two people really like it, it does mean that the learning experience is going to have gaps. So we need all four quadrants in our plan. Um, I'm gonna go through each of these quadrants in a bit more detail. And as you hear me describe them, think about which ones you think you align with. So when you think about learning experiences and what you like about them or where they've been frustrating, um, do, you, do you have a sense of which quadrant might be your preferred one and which ones might be your least preferred ones? And I think feel free to uh, share that in the chat as we're going through. Um, and in case you have been wondering, yes, we are going to use the Golden Girls to learn about the quadrants. Uh, because when you have a mini whiteboard and Golden Girl magnets and you're home a lot on your own, uh, these are the kind of instructional choices that you find yourself making. Uh, for those uh, younger folks on the call who might not have heard of the Golden Girls, I'm also just going to take this as a little teachable moment. Uh, so Golden Girls is a classic 1980 sitcom about four older women who live together in a house in Florida. Uh, and it just seemed like the perfect metaphor for today's world because, you know, we kind of find ourselves hunkering down at home, hanging out in the lanai or in the kitchen, having cheesecakes sort of at all hours of the day and night. So I thought it might be a good fit for that. Okay, so let's start with quadrant one, the why. So Blanche is the why. So Blanche's character, she was a Southern belle. She was very charming. Uh, she was sort of a flirt. And like Blanche, quadrant one is about engaging people in the content and sparking their interest. Why should your learners care about this? This is really what quadrant one is, is addressing. So it's helping people make that connection and find the relevance to their own lives and work. Um, it doesn't have to be something flashy. It doesn't have to be time consuming, but in your learning plan, think about the why and fostering this interest and engagement. How are you going to connect people to what they already know or where, where they're kind of at right now in, in this learning experience? Quadrant two um, is the what. So Sophia was the oldest golden girl, and she had this catchphrase where she'd be like, picture it. Sicily, 1922. And then she would go into some big life story that, that basically helped the other three understand their problems. So she was the wise one. She was the one with the knowledge and with the experience to share with the group. So like Sophia, quadrant two is the knowledge quadrant, the what. What do your learners need to know to be able to achieve these objectives? What are the, the big concepts, those, those key ideas, the most essential info? Um, and so in your learning plan, you want to think about what is the most vital content? What is the what for this topic, for these objectives? So quadrant three is the how, um, and the how is Dorothy. So Dorothy was a practical one, and she, she was known for her zinging one-liners that offered a very common sense, down-to-earth perspective. Uh, she was the doer of the group. She was the one who always got things done. And like Dorothy, quadrant three is about the practical, the how. How will learners apply these new ideas? What are they actually going to do with them? Um, so in your learning plan, you want to think about what are the opportunities for practice, for experimenting with, the, with these ideas? What are the chances to have a sort of hands-on application of the learning? And then we get to the final quadrant, quadrant four, the what if. And Rose is the quadrant four. She's the curious one. So she was really known for this sort of childlike wonder with the world. Uh, she had a take on things that was unique. She would frequently reference her very unusual hometown of St. Olaf. And like Rose, quadrant three is the creative quadrant. How will your learners adapt the ideas? So in quadrant three, they're getting that hands-on practice. They're, they're using it. 
Um, but it's, it's a little bit prescribed, so they're using it in a very narrow context. Um, as they develop that greater understanding, Quadrant 4 asks them to extend this learning into their own lives and their own work. And so in your learning plan, you want to think about the what if. Um, how will people create, evaluate, and refine what they've learned? Um, I would say in my experience, the two quadrants that are most often missed are probably quadrant one and quadrant four. So I think a lot of learning, we look at, uh, we start with quadrant two, we just start giving the info. Um, maybe quadrant three, we have people use it a little bit. And I, I think the challenge is, so if you scope quadrant one, uh, the learning remains very surface. So when we include it, we activate that previous knowledge and experience. And when we don't include it, it's really difficult for our learners to know where to place this knowledge. Uh, how does it fit in with their existing mental models? Um, and with quadrant four, when we skip it, what happens is that we really narrow the context for applying the skills. So if we don't help people with this adaptation piece and understanding you know, how, how an adaptation works or doesn't, um, we limit the ability to use what they've learned more broadly. And so what we tend to see is that uh, people know things, they can do them, but once they're back in their own context, that, that kind of drops off. So they, they don't transfer that skill to their own setting. So learning is a cycle, and you need to have all four quadrants in place for, for learning to really happen. Okay, and now we come to the third guiding principle, which is tapping into your creativity. Um, so I would say we've been doing a fantastic job with this pandemic. You know, people have been doing such wonderful um, parts of, of staying home as much as possible, wearing the mask, hand hygiene, all that good stuff. Um, most forecasts are suggesting that it's going to be a bit of a dance for some time. So we're doing all the right things, but we're going to have to keep doing them. We might be able to loosen these social distancing restrictions, but it's not going to be business as usual, so we'll still have some form of it in place. Um, and, and we might see a bit of a, a cycle of tightening and loosening just as we're managing, managing this, this virus. Uh, so what we're going to be doing for a while um, is probably remote learning. It's going to be in our foreseeable future. And so this next model is one that I find really helpful for thinking about what this process of translating learning from in-person to remote can look like. Uh, so this model is the SAMR model, um, and one thing I just want to say right off the bat is that it's, it's showing differences, but it's not suggesting that one level is better than, than the other. It's not a progression. So substitution isn't bad and redefinition isn't good. They're just different ways of using technology. So let's look at these levels. So in substitution, we basically use technology in the same way. So maybe instead of an in-person lecture, it's just going to be by webinar. Um, Zoom, WebEx, whatever you use them. In augmentation, we use technology to substitute and we add a little bit of extra functionality. So maybe that webinar lecture includes some chat questions, some polls. Um, both substitution and augmentation are enhancements, really. So nothing drastically changed. Uh, it's just a little bit different. So it's a very straightforward translation. Modification and redefinition, however, are transformative. So it takes the technology and it uses it in new and really significantly different ways. Um, and so we're going to look at an example, the technology of books. So back in 1440, uh, Gutenberg invents the printing press. I don't know if the guy really did much else, but that was a pretty big thing. That was a good invention. So uh, he gets done history for it. Uh, and so the image on the right is from the Gutenberg Bible, which is one of the first books printed on this newfangled machine that he created. So prior to Gutenberg, books were created by hand, usually by monks. Uh, they would work an entire life to create a single book. Um, I mean, they were monks. They were probably going out a lot and doing a lot of other things. They could focus, which is good. Um, and so they would make these books. They would be, you know, hand-drawn, these beautiful images that would be painted in. Very painstaking process. Took years and years. Wealthy people owned the books um, because they were really essentially works of art. And one of the things you notice about these early books is that they look a lot like pre-printing press books. So, you know, you can see the, the font is, it looks like calligraphy. It looks like someone would have written it by hand. They're still very ornate. And so this is substitution. So it's using the technology of the printing press, but using it to create something that looks almost exactly as the handmade ones. So then, after a few years, we see, um, we see a shift. So at some point, people realize, hey, this is a machine that can really crank these books things out. 
we should make the font simpler, then we'd use less paper, and then we could just make more of them. That seems like a good idea. Uh, and so we see this change to something much simpler, much closer to what we would now consider a modern print book, and this would be augmentation. So books are still pages, so they're still paper and ink um, created with a printing press, uh, but now they're much more streamlined, which means they become functionally more like books and less like works of art. And of course, this means that rather than having only a few books owned by only the wealthiest of people, um, dedicated to only the greatest of subjects, uh, you can now print books like How to Train Your Goldfish, um, because why not? We can. We have the technology, and so we're using it in a, in a different way. Uh, just as a side note, in the resources, there is a link to the Amazon uh, for How to Train Your Goldfish, not because I think you want to buy the book, but because the reviews are comedy gold. So I look forward to you with that. Uh, so we were sold enhancement with, with the first two, and, and then um, e-readers were created. And so this is where we see a, a major leap into modification, digital books. Um, so with digital books, it's no longer a physical media. You can carry an entire library in your hands. You can buy books anywhere, anytime, any subject. You can share them. You can highlight them. Um, you can store them. All these things that you couldn't do with the physical copies of books. And so it really is a major change in how we're using the technology of books. And fast forward um, a few iterations of e-readers, we've seen this evolve even further and completely redefining really the experience of, of reading books. Um, most e-readers today are fully immersive, so they can have videos, uh, they can connect to online book clubs, we can highlight books, uh, any word that you don't know, you don't have to schlep downstairs to get your dictionary to look it up, you just click on it and a glossary comes up immediately. Um, so it just really has redefined how we interact with books and has really thought about how the technology could support that redefinition. Uh, so that's one example. What does this model mean for you? So when you translate your learning from in-person to remote, think about how you want to use the technology to support the learning. So sometimes substitution is going to make the most sense. You know, an in-person lecture becomes a webinar. It's straightforward, totally a, a perfect fit. But as you have time and energy, and we are going to be doing this for a little while, uh, maybe it could look different. So the pandemic has introduced some constraints into how we work and live, but constraints are, are one way of fostering creativity. What would it look like if you augmented? What if you modified or redefined? How could that change the learning plan? Uh, so this isn't quite theoretical, so I thought it might be helpful to look at some examples and ideas, uh, just a few that I'm hoping might spark some creative thinking for you. So this was an example that I came across quite recently um, from South Polytech about the culinary arts program. So as you can imagine, uh, cooking school is very hands-on in its learning. Um, I'm actually a graduate of their professional cooking program. I have the burn marks to tell you exactly how hands-on this program really is. In all fairness, I'm very klutzy. Most of my, my fellow students didn't get burned quite as much. Uh, but it is hands-on learning. It's very, very experiential. Um, and so with social distancing, they have this very unique challenge. How do you take this very experiential program and translate it to a remote setting? Um, and what I love about this is you can see that the learning objectives were the true north for them. What they're trying to do with the learning is the same, having students learn how to cook. And it's just the how that's changed. So rather than being in the same physical space of this commercial kitchen, they've relocated to home kitchens with these webinar conferences. Um, and I think, you know, there's this realization, one of, the, one of the things they could have done was just had people come in, you know, socially distant, space time, come into the space. But, you know, it was that rethinking of, we just need a kitchen. And it doesn't have to be this kitchen. It could be any kitchen. And what could that look like? Um, and in the links, we do have the full story uh, if, if you're interested in, in learning how they approach this, but um, brilliant. Um, here's another example. Uh, so learning campaigns. I love learning campaigns. Often with our in-person training, we, we kind of maximize this, the fact that we have people together in the same physical space. So um, we're often factoring in travel time. People maybe have come across the province or from other places to, to come to our training. Um, so we're not going to have, here's a 20 minute workshop, you drove four hours, 20 minute workshop and off you go. Uh, typically we're going to make it a half day or a full day. But if travel time is no longer an issue, that kind of opens up the door to exploring things like micro learning, where we can break down the learning into these bite-sized chunks. 
Um, so, for example, uh, this is a learning campaign we did about how to create learning campaigns. It was very meta. Um, and so you can see the roadmap for it. So it took place over six weeks. There were some synchronous sessions where we, we learned together as a group. Uh, these were quick, about an hour or so, and often micro-learning sessions are even shorter, 10 minutes. Um, there was partner work, challenges, resources, a Slack channel to connect people between sessions. Um, and so, you know, what I love about learning campaigns is they are very flexible and engaging, and they can just incorporate such a broad range of strategies. So they, they, they break a lot of rules that we think we have about how training should happen. Um, here's another example. Love this one. So this is from John Spencer. He's amazing. He's a math teacher who does uh, incredible work with problem solving. Um, and so he had a Zoom session recently. He's a college teacher now. He'd been an elementary school math teacher for some time, and now he's teaching others how to teach. And so he had this Zoom session, and he gave this challenge to his learners. He said, go find something that represents how you're dealing with this pandemic and bring it back and tell us what you told us that. So they had 90 seconds. They had to go in their space, get up, find something, bring it back. And they brought all kinds of things, like KitchenAid mixers, guitars, just the most interesting of items, um, and had a really interesting discussion about creativity and, um, and, and what was sort of feeling their, their creative joys. Uh, and I just think this is an amazing Quadrant 1 activity, and it's so simple. It didn't need to be fancy, um, and it broke that unspoken rule that we seem to have, that once the video session starts, people have to stay in their seats. Uh, and again, this is something you couldn't do in person. You couldn't have someone drive four hours to your workshop and then say, go home and get an object from your house and come back in four hours. That, that's not going to work. But you can do it in remote learning. So again, a constraint can also be an opportunity. Um, so a few years ago, I worked on a course called the History of Popular Music, and it was so much fun. I, I learned that uh, every decade has its own Justin Timberlake, so this too shall pass, which is good to know. Um, and the course was offered completely online. So there were modules that had video clips and uh, archive photos and audio playlists. But one of my favorite things about it was the assignment, one of the assignments. So, um, so the assignment was to attend a live music performance and then critically analyze it. So, you know, the objective was to be able to critically analyze a live musical performance. And so we realized it could be any performance. Um, given that, that was the main goal, it could be anything. So at the beginning of the semester, we let students know that this was the assignment, which was going to be due at the end. So to start looking at, for an opportunity to attend a live music, uh, we have to make sure it could be accessible to everybody. So we had students in big cities and rural remote. Um, so they were told any kind of live music would count. So a choir singing hymns at a local church service, you got tickets to a big performance in an auditorium, a school performance, dive bar, or if you're lucky enough, National Treasure Rory Allen, who I love. Uh, whatever it was, as long as it was live and it was music, it was good. Um, and I think you know, it was a really good quadrant four because it, it took these ideas that people have been learning about performance and an, analyzing performance and took it to their own context, with, which they got to choose. Um, and it was really interesting to see all the different uh, live performances that, that people used for the assignment. Um, here's another example. So this, so this is the Carter Racing Game. So for those of you that aren't familiar, it is a case study. And so the premise of it is there's this team, they're race car drivers, they've had some crashes in the past, and they have to use the data from these crashes uh, to decide whether they're going to race in this upcoming race. Um, I'm not going to spoil the ending, but it's based on a real life decision. Uh, and most people do end up deciding a certain way based on, on the data that they see. So I've used this case study in in-person workshops, and typically what we would do is hand out the case study, people would be put into small groups, um, they would discuss it, and then we would have a larger group discussion, you know, what did you decide and why? Um, and so we had an online course and we wanted to, to include this, and so we could have substituted. We could have said, here's the reading, and then we had a small group discussion or a discussion forum. Um, would have been pretty similar. But the object is the objective. So the, the purpose of this exercise is to help people understand the impact of data on decision making. And so we use this tool in our learning platform called Lesson, which is essentially um, a choose your own adventure format. So we turned the case study into a scenario and learners had to make different decisions along the way. And then these different decisions would lead them to particular outcomes. 
Um, and I think one of the beautiful things about, about using this format is that people could go through this multiple times, and so they could make different decisions, and then they would see how those different decisions impacted the outcome or not. Uh, and so I think in some ways it was a much richer learning experience than we, how we typically done it in person. Um, and again, so it was, it was not a straight substitution. We, we really used the technology to redefine how people experience this. Uh, but for this, uh, you know, I think, I think it made sense for, for what we were trying to achieve with the objectives. Uh, Kathy Moore is also a fantastic educator. She does a lot with simulation and scenario-based learning. Um, so if you're at all interested in that, uh, Definitely check her out. This picture is from a scenario she developed around a client who wants training on, on operating chainsaws. That's all I'll say, go check it out. It's, it's really quite fun. Um, and then this one's another example. And, you know, obviously there were some resources that were invested into creating this. Um, but again, it's, it's a choose your own adventure. So you can pick uh, the area that you're interested in, so emergency room or labor and delivery. Um, and then there's these different scenarios that you walk through where they've incorporated videos just to, I think, you know, sort of amp up how authentic it feels. Um, but again, it's that idea of, you know, if you want, if you want to teach decision making, uh, this is a great way to give people that experiential practice with it um, in, in an environment that lets them kind of go through it again and again and try different things. Um, and we will have the link for that in the resource document as well. Um, these are just a few ideas. This is obviously by no means an exhaustive list, uh, but I think the key thing here is that there are many, many ways that learning can happen. The, the, the key really is to start with your objectives, really understand what it is that you're trying to do, what's going to be different for your learners by the end, create a plan that uses that full learning cycle, and then tap into your creativity to think about how you want to actually get there. Um, what are the different ways that you can use technology to support that? Uh, what does that translation look to? And how many rules do you maybe want to break or challenge yourself on in the process of getting there? All right, I am now going to pause for questions. I will sip coffee, looking intently at my camera, waiting for the questions to come in. And again, just encourage breaking the usual paradigm of remote learning, where we somehow think we just have to sit in front of the screen. Um, if you haven't done it already, please feel free just to have a quick stretch. I, I honestly don't know what the little break is. I can only presume there is not a wrong way to do it. Uh, if you want to put your camera on and share that with the world, um, be curious how people interpret that one. Uh, but definitely do a little bit of stretching just because uh, we have been sitting for a little bit. Um, and I will pause now for questions, comments, or great ideas from the group. I think my audio, I think my WebEx just cut out. I don't know if my audio is still working. No, we can still hear you, Sherry. Okay, good. My screen's just frozen. So I can't really see anything if there's stuff coming in the chat. Maybe uh, Chelsea can flag for me. Sure, no worries. Um, so while we're waiting for uh, questions to come through, um, if you're still collecting your thoughts, feel free to uh, take a moment and um, add them in the chat. Uh, but uh, Sherry, do you want to walk us through your resources while we're waiting for questions? Yes. I cannot do anything with my screen, so I have to get someone to be able to take the uh, presentation. Yeah, I, have, I right. have the ball and I've uh, transitioned to the resources screen. Okay. It's not looking like that for me. Um, hang on. I'm just going to, uh, no, literally can't do anything. Um, okay, so I will go from memory and Chelsea can prompt me if, uh, if I'm missing anything. Um, so I, I mentioned a couple of people that I follow. Uh, so Kathy Moore, John Spencer, they're fantastic. Um, a few others that I think are just wonderful. Uh, Jane Hart does a lot on workplace learning. So she, she has a lot on what she calls the modern workplace. Uh, so I find she has just really good information. Um, Kathy Schrock has, I love it, it's called the guide to everything. Uh, so she does a lot with learning technology, and so I think does a really good job of always keeping it updated, kind of sharing new tools, new resources. 
Uh, so, you know, when you're starting to think about, like, I'd really like to be able to do this, um, choose a great resource to go, okay, what tools could actually help me do that? Uh, and then Julie Dirksen is, um, she wrote a book, which is also appears in the book list called Design for How People Learn, which is an, a, an amazing resource. She also has a Facebook group of, uh, for based on Design for How People Learn, which is really helpful. It's a wonderful community. People post questions and there's lots of feedback, suggestions, ideas. If there's something that you're thinking about trying, 99% of the time somebody else has tried it, so they'll give you kind of their hard-earned wisdom on it. Um, so uh, that's also one, one to check out. Um, in terms of books, I mentioned Design for How People Learn. It is a really good resource, very practical, uh, beautiful way of explaining things. Um, I also really like Make It Stick just because it goes uh, over the neuroscience of learning but does it in a very uh, straightforward, practical way. Um, Learn or Die, it's a very dire title. <laughs> Uh, but a really nice focus on organizational learning and how you support that and, and again, sort of um, looks at different ways that people have approached it, so some really interesting ideas with it. Uh, Show Your Work by Jane Bozart. Um, is, so it's this whole idea about working out loud, which again, um, not, it's not like specific on here's how you create a learning plan, but it does a really nice job of challenging uh, the learning process and just thinking about different ways of making that more visible and more shared with folks. Chelsea, are there any books on there that I've, that I've missed? You did a really great job, Sherry, from memory. Uh, I also shared a screenshot of this uh, in Teams for you to oh. cheat off of, but you are doing a great job. Um, my whole computer's frozen, so literally nothing. I don't want to touch anything. Oh, anyway. fun. Okay. <laughs> well, I see that you've also dropped off our panelist list, so I'm going to get these questions to you um, just in case okay. how your audio decides to cut out as well. Uh, so our first one is from Charles C. Uh, she yeah. says, let's say your audience is elementary school children. Is the okay. format model just as important to use for the little tykes? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, there's a lot of different um, perspectives on adult learning theory. And, you know, I mean, I think, I think at a very high level, um, learning is learning. Um, you know, what would change is how you do it, I would say, for elementary or really little kids versus adults, right? But it is still um, that connection of all those four pieces, which is where learning happens. Um, and, you know, for Bernice McCarthy, uh, really interesting woman. She's done a lot of research. So they have looked at the format model in, in a range of settings, including elementary, um, higher education, uh, professional education, and it has been pretty consistent throughout. So yeah, so it's one of those models that applies to a lot of different contexts. Great, thank you. Um, another question uh, from Jocelyn, what are your top three to five digital tools that you have used to support creating online content? There are so many. How do you narrow it down? Uh, so shout out to Canva. Canva is absolutely not Canvas. There is a learning management system called Canvas. So it's Canva, no S on the end. Um, absolutely wonderful site. So many free things available. They do have a premium version. I've never actually had a need to use it because they have so much good content just readily available. Um, so and you can use, I mean, you can use it to make worksheets. You can use it to make slides. Uh, they're getting more into some of the animation. So it's, it's an excellent tool. Um, there's a paid product called Simple Diagrams that I absolutely love. It's a paid product, but it's, I think it's like 30, 30 or $50 US. And that's a lifetime license. You can have it on up to three devices um, for creating diagrams and visuals. I really love that one uh, because it works. It works really, really well. Um, and I'm still, I've been using it for probably five or six years and I'm still discovering new functionality with it. Uh, and then I think, you know, the other, the other tools, um, if you can find a really good screen recorder, um, that's always helpful. The one that I've used is Screencast-O-Matic, which I, it has enough editing tools that it's helpful for someone that doesn't really know much about editing. Um, I think there might be other products out there that have have maybe more editing editing capability, but then you'd have to figure out how to use it. So I find it's a nice it's for people that don't do a lot of video editing. It's it's pretty uh, intuitive with how to use it. 
Thanks, Sherry. Uh, Suzanne asks, uh, any words of wisdom on how to handle tech problems while you're live? And we're living through that right now. So <laughs> tell us more about how you're dealing with it, Sherry. Um, you know, so, so I, I mentioned that I had been, I, I had gone in the professional cooking program. And, you know, I, I learned a lot from that. Like, you learn how to get along with people because everyone has hot pans and knives. And so you really have to work on your, your interpersonal skills. Um, but one of the one of the lessons that stuck out, I remember one of our instructors saying, "You're never stuck." So, if if your oven breaks down and the roast isn't done and the, the dinner time's still coming, you take the roast out and you throw it on on the stove. Um, he's like, "You're never stuck. You always find another way." And I think you know, with tech problems, that's what it is. You you always figure out another way. So if I were to be kicked out of this entirely right now, um, I would dial in from a different device like and you know part of it is thinking about what could go wrong and a little bit of prepping contingency planning um but you, you just you just deal with it and i think you know one of the blessings with the time that we're in um is i i feel like we we have a lot more forgiveness for each other maybe than than when it was a rare thing that we'd be online we, we recognize the, the more you do it the more likely things are to crop up the more likely we're going to hear dog barking or whatever so my hunch is that when we come out of this we're going to have a, a, a more um, gentle expectation of how perfect the technology has to be and a, a whole new skill set for how we manage when it's not Thanks, Sherry. Uh, Suzanne, we took a, a course uh, from the Grove Consultants International on facilitating virtual collaboration. And one of the words of wisdom that they offered us was, uh, in the virtual world, uh, anticipate that things will go wrong and plan for it. So they uh, managed our expectations accordingly and said, over the course of this uh, one week that we're spending together, something will go wrong. Uh, let's be kind and gentle to ourselves and let's just have a plan in place for when that happens. Uh, so that was really freeing to me anyways, um, to just have that, uh, you know, it's not that you're failing if something goes wrong, but you should have uh, a plan in place to deal with that. So one of the things that we're doing behind the scenes is that we always have a back channel going. Uh, for exactly this reason, if uh, if one platform stops working or if something unexpected happens, we have uh, another line of communication between our presenters that we leverage. Um, so I think we have time for one more question, Sherry, before we close out. Um, a question from Kathy. Do you have an organizational learning plan template? Uh, does such a thing exist? Yeah, so um, so we have a blueprint template that we use when we plan our learning. Uh, so it, it sort of you know maps out what are what are some of the known. So who is this for? What do we know about our learner? Um, how does this fit in maybe with previous learning or with learning that might be coming next in the sequence? What are the objectives? And then from there mapping out what are the different? How are we sequencing this? What are the activities? What are the materials? Um, what are the, I guess, sort of notes for what does this plan actually look like? How much time are we kind of anticipating? Uh, and I do believe, Chelsea, that will be part of the resources that we share. Yes, um, and so if you're looking uh, for where to find these resources, uh, I know that the link has been shared out a couple times in the chat. If you just scroll down to the bottom of the page, uh, there's a couple of documents that have been linked uh, to the bottom as PDF copies. Uh, so that's where you can find um, these resources that are listed under and some handouts you might enjoy. Uh, so um, you can check those out there. Uh, so, sorry, go ahead, Sherry. Oh, you know, one of the things I really love about the template too is that I think it scales. So it could be a template that you use for an hour um, webinar, or it could be um, if you're planning an entire program or 10 month course, uh, you know, it's just sort of like the, you kind of work your way down to the different levels of detail. But it is what I like about it is it is very flexible. And then you can almost um, kind of scaffold or link them together, almost like little nesting eggs. Thanks so much, Sherry, and thanks for sharing your experience with us. Um, I love so much when we can uh, pair real-time opportunities with people who uh, 
love to talk about their areas of passion and it's very obvious that this is an area of passion for you. So thanks for taking the time to um, share your learning with us and make it fun. Uh, you're always so great at that. Uh, thanks for uh, the teachable moment of the Golden Girls for folks who uh, perhaps <laughs> didn't grow up in that era. Uh, so as we've been doing with the Working Remotely series, uh, we've encouraged you to reframe um, what sometimes might seem as big topics that this might be your first foray into exploring and break that down into a simple first step, um, a frame of reference that we often use in the world of quality improvement when we're tackling complex challenges is the idea of uh, asking yourself, what can you do by next Tuesday? So if you're comfortable sharing, I'd uh, encourage you to uh, share in the chat what you plan on doing by next Tuesday in terms of incorporating some of the things that you've heard today uh, into your work um, moving forward. And while you're doing that, um, I'd like to just raise your attention to our next session in the Working Remotely series, uh, which will be on building trust with teams in a virtual environment. Uh, so we know that uh, trust among team members is a foundational component of high performing teams, uh, but also that it's a little bit more difficult to build that trust um, in a virtual environment. So uh, in a couple weeks from now on May 22nd, uh, we'll be going through some ways, some strategies and techniques that you can use with your teams uh, to help you build some of that trust in a virtual environment. So Riley will be sharing out the link. And uh, for those of you whose interest was piqued in the topic of learning campaigns, uh, Sherry will also be doing uh, another session on May 29th, uh, where she'll delve into uh, learning campaigns a little bit more and talk about how they can be applied both in an in-person setting as well as a virtual setting. Uh, so those, both of those sessions are live on our WebEx page, so you can sign up to them. Um, and uh, we'll be sending out MailChimp campaigns uh, to advertise these sessions in more detail. Uh, as, as those of you who have been following the series will know, uh, we've been doing these in a bit of a rolling development, so um, trying to be responsive to, uh, to the needs and uh, interests of our learning community. Uh, so we'll be sharing out further details uh, on that. And Chelsea, um, yes. with the learning campaign, just uh, if somebody has, if your interest has been piqued and you have a topic that you think, oh, I think we might actually like to do a learning campaign on that, um, I'd say maybe reach out to me too because I think uh, it could be interesting to to put it in as a little bit of a case study and maybe build it as a as a group. Perfect. Uh, so I'll get Riley to share out Sherry's uh, email that you can reach out to her if you'd like her to do some of the heavy lifting for you. This is a great opportunity to uh, help have her help you explore uh, how that topic could look like for you. And so with that, in the spirit of continuous improvement, uh, as always, we welcome your feedback on today's session. Uh, just a reminder that um, as you close out of today's session, a survey will launch for you. Uh, you might see this prompt. It's just telling you that you're being redirected to an external site outside of WebEx. Uh, so we do encourage you to click continue to move through uh, and to provide us your feedback on what you found went well today, um, as well as how we can improve these sessions for uh, moving into the future. So thanks again for spending an hour of your time with us today. Um, and we'll look forward to having you back again soon. Stay safe, everyone. Take care.